Hello, this is Monique from the Caldwell Public Library with another recording of our Sherlock Holmes story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Previously, Holmes and Watson were just scratching the surface of this mystery in Boscombe, and we will read on to find out how Sherlock Holmes will dig for the clues. It was late before Sherlock Holmes returned. He came back alone, for Lestrade was staying in lodgings in the town. The glass still keeps very high, he remarked as he sat down. It is of importance that it should not rain before we are able to go over the ground. On the other hand, a man should be at his very best and keenest for such nice work as that, and I did not wish to do it when fagged by a long journey. I have seen young McCarthy. And what did you learn from him? Nothing. Could he throw no light? None at all. I was inclined to think at one time that he knew who had done it and was screening him or her, but I am convinced now that he is as puzzled as everyone else. He is not a very quick-witted youth, though comely to look at and, I should think, sound at heart. I cannot admire his taste, I remarked, if it is indeed a fact that he was averse to a marriage with so charming a young lady as this Miss Turner. Ah, thereby hangs a rather painful tale. This fellow is madly, insanely in love with her, but some two years ago, when he was only a lad, and before he really knew her, for she had been away five years at a boarding school, what does the idiot do but get into the clutches of a barmaid in Bristol and marry her at a registry office? No one knows a word of the matter, but you can imagine how maddening it must be to him to be upbraided for not doing what he would give his very eyes to do, but what he knows to be absolutely impossible. It was sheer frenzy of this sort which made him throw his hands up into the air when his father, at their last interview, was goading him on to propose to Miss Turner. On the other hand, he had no means of supporting himself, and his father, who was by all accounts a very hard man, would have thrown him over utterly had he known the truth. It was with the, his barmaid that he had spent the last three days in Bristol, and his father did not know where he was. Mark that point. It is of importance. Good has come out of evil, however, for the barmaid, finding from the papers that he is in serious trouble and likely to be hanged, has thrown him over utterly and has written to him to say that she has a husband already in the Bermuda dockyard, so that there is really no tie between them. I think that that bit of news has consoled young McCarthy for all that he has suffered. But if he is innocent, who has done it? Ah, who? I would call your attention very particularly to two points. One is that the murdered man had an appointment with someone at the pool, and that the someone could not have been his son, for his son was away, and he did not know when he would return. The second is that the murdered man was heard to cry cooey before he knew that his son had returned. Those are the crucial points upon which this case depends. And now let us talk about George Meredith, if you please, and we shall leave all minor matters until tomorrow. There was no rain, as Holmes had foretold, and the morning broke bright and cloudless. At nine o'clock Lestrade called for us with the carriage, and we set off for Hatherley Farm and the Boscombe Pool. There is serious news this morning, Lestrade observed. It is said that Mr. Turner of the Hall is so ill that his life is despaired of. An elderly man, I presume, said Holmes. About sixty, but his constitution has been shattered by his life abroad, and he has been in failing health for some time. This business has had a very bad effect upon him. He was an old friend of Mr. McCarthy's and, I may add, a great benefactor to him, for I have learned that he gave him Hatherley Farm rent-free. Indeed, that is interesting, said Holmes. Oh, yes, in a hundred other ways he has helped him, 
Everybody about here speaks of his kindness to him. Really, does it not strike you as a little singular that this McCarthy, who appears to have had little of his own, and to have been under such obligations to Turner, should still talk of marrying his son to Turner's daughter, who is, presumably, heiress to the estate, and that in such a very cocksure manner, as if it were merely a case of a proposal and all else would follow. It is the more strange, since we know that Turner himself was averse to the idea. The daughter told us as much. Do you not deduce something from that? We've got to the deductions and the inferences, said Lestrand, weakening at me. I find it hard enough to tackle facts, Holmes, without flying away after theories and fancies. You are right, said Holmes demurely. You do find it very hard to tackle the facts. Anyhow, I have grasped one fact which you seem to find it difficult to get hold of, replied Lestrade with some warmth. And that is... That McCarthy Sr. met his death from McCarthy Jr. and that all theories to the contrary are the merest moonshine. Well, moonshine is a brighter thing than fog, said Holmes, laughing, but I am very much mistaken if this is not Hatherley Farm upon the left. Yes, that is it. It was a widespread, comfortable-looking building, two-storied, slate-roofed, with great yellow blotches of lichen upon the gray walls. The drawn blinds and the smokeless chimneys, however, gave it a stricken look, as though the weight of this horror still lay heavy upon it. We called at the door when the maid, at Holmes's request, showed us the boots which her master wore at the time of his death, and also a pair of the sons, though not the pair which he had then had. Having measured these very carefully from seven or eight different points, Holmes desired to be led to the courtyard, from which we all followed the winding track which led to Boscombe Pool. Sherlock Holmes was transformed when he was hot upon such a scent as this. Men who had only known the quiet thinker and logician of Baker Street would have failed to recognize him. His face flushed and darkened. His brows were drawn into two hard black lines while his eyes shone out from beneath him with a steely glitter. His face was bent downward, his shoulders bowed, his lips compressed, and the veins stood out like whipcord in his long sinewy neck. His nostrils seemed to dilate with a purely animal lust for the chase, and his mind was so absolutely concentrated upon the matter before him that a question or remark fell unheeded upon his ears or, at the most, only provoked a quick, impatient snarl in reply. Swiftly and silently he made his way along the track which ran through the meadows and so by way of the woods to the Boscombe Pool. It was damp, marshy ground, as is all that district, and there were marks of many feet, both upon the path and amid the short grass which bounded it on either side. Sometimes Holmes would hurry on, sometimes stop dead, and once he made quite a little detour into the meadow. Lestrade and I walked behind him, the detective indifferent and contemptuous, while I watched my friend with the interest which sprang from the conviction that every one of his actions was directed towards a definite end. The Boscombe Pool, which is a little reed-girt sheet of water some fifty yards across, is situated at the boundary between the Hatherley Farm and the private park of the wealthy Mr. Turner. Above the woods which lined it upon the farther side we could see the red, jutting pinnacles which marked the site of the rich landowner's dwelling. On the Hatherley side of the pool the woods grew very thick and there was a narrow belt of sod and grass twenty paces across between the edge of the trees and the reeds which lined the lake. Lestrade showed us the exact spot at which the body had been found and indeed so moist was the ground that I could plainly see the traces which had been left by the fall of the stricken man. To Holmes, as I could see by his eager face and peering eyes, very many other things were to be read upon the trampled grass. He ran round like a dog who was picking up a scent and then turned upon my companion. "'What did you go into the pool for?' he asked. "'I fished about with a rake. I thought there might be some weapon or other trace. But how on earth 
Oh, tut tut, I have no time. That left foot of yours with its inward twist is all over the place. A mole could trace it, and there it vanishes among the reeds. Oh, how simple it would all have been had I been here before they came like a herd of buffalo and wallowed all over it. Here is where the party with the lodge keeper came, and they have covered all tracks for six or eight feet round the body. But here are three separate tracks of the same feet. He drew out a lens and lay down upon his waterproof to have a better view, talking all the time rather to himself than to us. These are young McCarthy's feet. Twice he was walking, and once he ran swiftly so that the soles are deeply marked and the heels are hardly visible. That bears out his story. He ran when he saw his father on the ground, then here at the father's feet as he paced up and down. What is this, then? It is the butt end of a gun, and the son stood listening. And this, ha ha, what have we here? Tiptoes, tiptoes, square. Two quite unusual boots. They come, they go, they come again. Of course, that was for the cloak. Now, where did they come from? He ran up and down, sometimes losing, sometimes finding the track until we were well within the edge of the wood and under the shadow of a great beech, the largest tree in the neighborhood. Holmes traced his way to the farther side of this and lay down once more upon his face with a little cry of satisfaction. For a long time he remained there, turning over the leaves and dried sticks, gathering up what seemed to me to be dust into an envelope and examining with his lens not only the ground, but even the bark of the tree as far as he could reach. A jagged stone was lying among the moss, and this also he carefully examined and retained. Then he followed a pathway through the wood until he came to the high road where all traces were lost. It has been a case of considerable interest, he remarked, returning to his natural manner. I fancy that this gray house on the right must be the lodge. I think that I will go in and have a word with Moran and perhaps write a little note. Having done that, we may drive back to our luncheon. You may walk to the cab and I shall be with you presently. It was about ten minutes before we regained our cab and drove back into Ross, Holmes still carrying with him the stone which he had picked up in the wood. This may interest you, Lestrade, he remarked, holding it out. The murder was done with it. I see no marks. There are none. How do you know, then? The grass was growing under it. It had only lain there a few days. There was no sign of a place where it had been taken. It corresponds with the injuries. There is no sign of any other weapon. And the murderer is a tall man, left-handed, limps with the right leg, wears thick-soled shooting boots and a gray cloak, smokes Indian cigars, uses a cigar holder, and carries a blunt penknife in his pocket. There are several other indications, but these may be enough to aid us in our search. Lestrade laughed. I am afraid that I am still a skeptic, he said. Theories are all very well, but we have to deal with a hard-headed British jury. No, Veron, answered Holmes calmly. You work your own method, and I shall work mine. I shall be busy this afternoon and shall probably return to London by the evening train. And leave your case unfinished? No, finished. But the mystery? It is solved. Who was the criminal then? The gentleman I describe. But who is he? Surely it would not be difficult to find out. This is not such a populous neighborhood. Lestrade shrugged his shoulders. I am a practical man, he said, and I really cannot undertake to go about the country looking for a left-handed gentleman with a game leg. I should become the laughing stock of Scotland Yard. All right, said Holmes quietly. I have given you the chance. Here are your lodgings. Goodbye. I shall drop you a line before I leave. Having left Lestrade at his rooms, we drove to our hotel, where we found lunch upon the table. Holmes was silent and buried in thought with a pained expression upon his face as one who finds himself in a perplexing position. "'Look here, Watson,' he said when the cloth was cleared. "'Just sit down in this chair and let me preach to you for a little. I don't know quite what to do. I should value your advice. Light a cigar and let me expound.' Pray do so.
That concludes part three of this week's virtual reading. Tune in next week to hear more from the Boscombe Valley Mystery.